Welcome to the Pint with Shoney B coming to you on a summer's evening in a lovely pub called Angel St. Giles. And that means that we are actually having a pint. Well, we're not, we're having a glass of wine. We are drinking. We're, we're drinking enough. We are drinking enough. Yeah. <laughs> I have a poet with me today, uh, Patrick Davidson Roberts. He was put in touch with me by a previous guest, uh, David Harsant, who recommended him. He is a what would you call yourself? A mover, in, an up and coming mover and shaker in the British poetry scene. How does that sound? Well, up and coming makes me sound a little bit yeah, younger than I am. Um, <laughs> mover and mover and shaker. So I tend to think of myself more <laughs> more as insulter and bottler. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I've, you know, I've, di- I've dipped my bread. Patrick Gare's first book, uh, The Mains, uh, was released in 2017. 18. 18. And he has also edited The Next Review, which is a bi monthly magazine. It was, it was a bi monthly print magazine. Of poetry and prose. Yeah. It was born out of an interest in Ian Hamilton, the poet and critic and editor of the 60s and 70s. Um, his collected poems came out from favour and I was just swept away by them. I met the poet and critic Declan Ryan and we used to talk a lot about Hamilton. And then I, I sort of went around Hamilton's literary set from the 60s and 70s. I mean, very famous names like Julian Barnes, Neil McEwen mm-hmm. and Melvin Bragg and people. Poets from the 60s when he was running the reviews. So David Harson, Hugo Williams... Douglas Dunn, people like that. Mm-hmm. And David very kindly invited me down one summer's evening. I mean, we drank two bottles of wine. And, and at one point, David said, what we really want is a little magazine that's regular, cheap, and, you know, quite fierce, and things yeah. like that. And I'm afraid of giving bad views for the right reasons. And he said, what we're waiting for is the next review, but it'll never happen. It wasn't like a sort of like the baton being passed or anything like that. But I felt that me and Deb sitting around in pubs complaining about the fact that we didn't like many magazines and things mm. it was all very well and fun but actually going up and doing something as two quite hard bitten socialists seemed to make more sense you're, so give me some, a sense of your background because uh, you're from the north of England mm. Sunderland Durham yeah, area. Sunderland and Durham yeah. The, yeah what was it like growing up for you was it um, well, happy or I grew up largely in Durham and then for two years we moved down to London and it was between me being about five and me being about seven and that's when children form their accents. Two examples out the air are Kenneth Branagh and Sting. One of them should have a very strong Northern Irish accent, and one yeah. of them should have a very strong Geordie accent, yeah. but they don't because they lived somewhere else between those years. And so I have this neutral accent. I have Mac and vowels which come out when I'm angry or I'm drunk. People yeah. in the North think I'm a Southern, people in the South think I'm a Northern. Yeah, it's quite neutral. So I'm, my dad's a vicar and my mum's a teacher. We were quite poor. Mm. Um, yeah, we had books around that, which I think does make a difference to how you view yourself in your class. Mm. But we weren't comfortably middle class. And we lived in very working class areas, very run down post industrial, post Thatcher areas. Mm. And so, again, there was a kind of fish out water thing there, like the accent, which mm. was I wasn't from the north, but I was living there. I wasn't working class, but I wasn't middle class either. Mm. Did you have brothers yeah. and sisters? I've got one sister who's two years younger than me, but because she's pretty much the same height as me, we've always viewed ourselves as twins. twins. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm very, very close to my mum, my dad and my sister. We have a fantastic right. relationship. I think that's always meant that I, I probably had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about other people. As in, I, well, I have very high standards. I can um, see that. We've only just met and I've got a little bit of an awe of you. <laughs> no, no. But um, um, do you have like high standards in a sort of that way where it's like it has to be perfect or? Well, I, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I mean, among other things, we, we might get into this later, but I, I, among, among other things, I, I suffer from bipolar disorder and um, okay. I do swing from extremes and I know that that's an illness and I know that's a problem yeah. but I know that it also aligns with quite a Puritan streak in me which I think is more formed by sort of the Christian socialism I grew up in than perhaps I, I realised at the time there is a part of me which is to do with that I know that's a mental illness I know that there's nothing to do about it but I also know that there is a tendency in me which I think is separate from that to go towards um, towards sort of brilliant at one end and absolute horror at the other yeah. end and um, you know but you're very hard on yourself oh, oh hugely so yeah, yeah, so yeah. It, it would be like, a dis, 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 it would be a di, disappointing um, creative to press if it wasn't you know I, I write in, in splurges right. very heavily intense splurges and then I edit, uh, edit them to death with yeah. you know sort of no mercy and then I sit around the rest of the time and sort of going, God, it'd be, it'd be nice to just sit somewhere in the sun and, and get a pen out and do some writing wouldn't it but I can't you know for some reason Sadly, I, that portrait is never waiting. You and know. it's never procrastination, is it? No. It's, it's, it's almost more like a waiting for a muse. 
I mean, it's what it is. It's a pathetic excuse no, for procrastination for some people. But, but, but it's not. I mean, when, you, when you're sitting around watching, watching the endless episodes of um, Vikings or something yeah. like that, um, there is that nagging thing in the back of the head which is going, you're just watching this and it's not doing anything. But if I were to turn the TV off at that point and go and sit down at my desk, I'm not going to get anything either. No. And I mean, it's why you see people... I, I used to live with my mate Elliot who play the enormous amount of Halo and things like that. I never had consoles when I grew up, so consoles are always quite exciting like, mm. to watch. But rather than play them, I like to watch people play. Them. Yeah. And and also there was this the industry. Yeah, and there was this there was this sort of hunger and ferocity of him going through this game and wanting to wanting to get to the end. Mm. In the way that when I play when I play computer games and I'm one of the few people who I, I think I'm the only person ever on the Sophie's World computer game which involved wandering around sort of ancient Greece discovering some perspective and um, explains a little bit. But when, there when, is such a thing. You know, <laughs> yeah, the there's a CD-ROM and everything like that. Um, <laughs> but I remember like, from time to time I would play on his games like, um, and Assassin's Creed 2 was a fully realised Renaissance Florence. And because I read sort of Dante and Mike Evaluo, I was like 12 and 13 and this was my, my whole little world. Yeah, yeah. He would come down and he's like, you're still just running around the rooftops. I was like, it's Florence. I know. I, I mean, know. you know, he's like, but there are things to do in the game. I know, and that's I was, hilarious. I actually looked at them kind of like drugs because I kind of went... I can see myself spending seven hours a day playing that yeah. thing. And um, back in when I was in Australia, in probably about two thousand, I played uh, Tomb Raider, mm. which is vapid and easy. You know, like I, I can't do it. Speak for yourself. Well, no, but you know, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> gamers would poo-poo it. You yeah. know. Yeah. But I used to also work during the night. I, I was working advertising and I was doing freelance work, and I just it was just the time I could get most silence. And. Um, I remember I could I would just go over and play that game, but there would be one monkey in my head that would not be playing the game, that would yeah. be working on whatever I was trying to write or work that yeah. work out. And I could suddenly just pause and go straight over to my computer and just for like three straight hours. Just yeah. everything comes out. As if that monkey's gone, okay, God, I've on the other two. Well, do we have to stop? There's a poem I felt barking called Virgis City. It was about times to sort of get Larkin out of the house. So all yeah. the in- invites he'd get saying, you know, do you want to come around and chat to me and my lovely friends and things like that yeah. and he says no and then the entire poem is about him going on the one hand he says at one, at one, one point funny how hard it is to be alone I'd sort of like to be the person who could go and stand around with, with you know as he says a glass of washing cherry but on the other hand there's part of him that knows that he has to stay home and, and wait for the poem uh, much as I think Saul Bellow said about John Berryman because Saul Bellow used to bump into John Berryman in, in the White Horse that probably drank in mm. and Saul Bellow has this wonderful line where he said you know there was John sitting there and, and the fin- finally the poems were coming and they were killing him and um, uh, and it was a sense the White of Horse in, in New York yeah, yeah. yeah I've been there like, yeah. living here oh, well, um, you're so. celebrated well possibly your first home run maybe, or maybe the second home run because I know you did the Masters before that but the PhD you did on Larkin Mm. Um, where do you, where do you, I didn't read it in the time we <laughs> but where do you stand on him because he is very uh, polarising right yeah yeah um, my interest in like, I'm, I'd, I ended up doing the PhD because I, I went to a very very good state conference I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that however complicated my class identity is the rest of the time mm. but um, I once had a conversation with a very very good English teacher and like all poets I had that English teacher he said to me at one point he said the way you write essays it's not going to work at GCSE and it's not going to work at A-level. By the way, it's not going to work at undergrad and it's not going to work at master's. Yeah. You'll, do, you'll write a really good PhD though. And so I sort of took him hostage for the next 15 years that it took to get from there to doing the PhD. Which he was I'm, unlearning you. No, no he, was, he was saying, it isn't that this isn't good writing, yeah. but this, this isn't opinion evidence analysis, which is, uh, or point evidence analysis in order to a P, as a, you know, whatever acronym. It felt like an investment from him. And he didn't come from a must be different background to me. And so I, I got through my GCSE, not particularly impressive GCSEs, not particularly impressive A levels, uh, went to the wrong university for a year, dropped out, worked, was a bricklayer, was a bouncer, did lots of other stuff, then came to London. Pause there for a second. So, so when you were when you left the school yeah. and you were working with this English teacher and then you left the college yeah. and now you were a bouncer. Yeah. What was your head? What was this? You were always clear this was temporary, and you had the vision. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I, I went. I went to univer- I went to the wrong university in the wrong town to do the wrong degree. And you knew first. I, okay. I knew after a year, and I dropped out. Okay. But I stayed in the. I stayed in the city. It was in York, and I got a series of jobs. In I mean, it was during. We look back on it now. The the halcyon days of Labour government, when if you were young and you were unemployed, 
there was a job center wait which you would go into and they would say let us help you let's do some skills so so i got a level one security certificate and quite a few poets interestingly have level one security qualifications i, I stopped doing it after i moved down to london and tried to do it for a bit and somebody pulled a knife and suddenly i realized that in in the northeast there'd be a fight mm-hmm. but there were very very rarely weapons in and you know you're just like this isn't worth it yeah i always knew it was a temporary thing my the, in fact, something changed it was january 2007 when i was living I was doing a sort of office job in York and I'd saved up and I came down to London and I went and saw Equus with Daniel Radcliffe and um, Richard Griffith said and Equus had always been like an, as a play I'd, I'd always been obsessed with it. I'd seen the Richard Burton film you know I knew big bits of it off by art and there was one Saturday night where I was just walking down Shaftesbury Avenue and it was cold and it was but it was bright and I was going to see this play and I was in London and I just thought I need to come to London and so I mean within the month I had left my job in York and went to King's College and did comparative literature. And then I did a master's at King's. As, as my dad has said to me recently, I made the mistake of staying in the same place to do a master's. But I was using the master's entirely as a stepping stone to get to PhD. Mm-hmm. And I did it in, in, in an English department, and I hated it. I suddenly realized why I didn't like English as an academic subject, because it, particularly in quite a conservative university like uh, KCL, where they think that the Wasteland was the last thing that was written. I remember going t- to chat to my or whatever she was mm. and she, I said I, I'm looking to do a PhD and she went right and just look at disinterest I wasn't one of the high flyers I wasn't going to yeah. bring the university money if they funded me and so she wasn't interested and I said I'd like to do it in the unexpected influences on Philip Larkin and she said don't do it here and I went if I was looking around the colleges and she went well the important thing is that you shouldn't do it here why? and I went Yes, but uh, whichever you know, called it, and she went, don't do it here. And I went, why do you feel me say that to me three times when, yes. by the way, it's your job to actually offer some help and support at this point? Yeah. And, and having grown up in a house with a vicar and a state school teacher who are people who actually go out and serve the public, mm. as opposed to academics who exist in a bizarre halfway point between. More of that later. And I went down to Goldsmiths and I talked to Chris. And the Goldsmiths is at the other end of the you know, spectrum from KCL, politically, socially, all that stuff. And I talked to Chris Baldick, who's a professor there, and he, and he said, I like the idea. I don't know whether you're going to be able to pull it off, but I like the idea. And that, that was essentially what teachers should say. Correct. So I then spent two and a half years. Um, so it's my, it's my only academic achievement, so I like to brag that I did a PhD in two and a half years, because I did. Um, and the argument <laughs> but was... But layman this for me. Yeah. Okay, layman. so Philip Larkin... So was, Philip, Philip Larkin, very, as you say, very polarising, um, known to be sort of the poetry world's version of Norman Tebbit, reviled as being, you know, he just writes stuff that rhymes, he hides in the university library in Hull, you know, he spends with racists. When his letters were published, there were one or two racist yeah. jokes in them. And then later on, we found like pornography. pornography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yes, he's the only man in the world who's ever had an interest that, in pornography. Apart from us um, as well. Having the, yeah. <laughs> yes, having the um, oh, no, no, I knew the professional level of interest that Larkin did. <laughs> but um, I knew there was something more to it because he's just that good as a poet. And one of the things that enlivened my interest in it was that he'd been a near contemporary of my grandfather and my great uncle at mm. university in Oxford during World War II and my late grandfather died when I was 14 and um, had a lot of the books around the place and my grandmother would always say take some books if you like poetry take some books and the 1998 collected Larkin by Andy Thwaite which was very controversial at the time because it showed you all of the stuff that he hadn't published as well and suddenly detractors hated it because they're like oh there's just more of this we didn't like him anyway but there's more of it but interestingly his friends and his admirers like Ian Hamilton and Clive James and Martin Amos mm. felt that this was embarrassing and that there shouldn't be all this stuff. Okay. And so weirdly, his friends and admirers they have done him as much damage critically as his Do you his, think it's fair for a writer? Do you think, I think you would be very annoyed if someone found a case full of stuff you didn't know about published and published it well, posthumously, would you? Or, no, but the, the argument's made well by Ian Hamilton, uh, which is that Larkin appointed... Anthony Thwaite and Andrew Motion, who were two poets. They were literary friends, but they were poets. And he knew they had an interest in his work. And so, for example, he left orders for his diaries to be destroyed, and they were destroyed the next day. Um, Although Andrew Motion admits that if he'd he'd been able to stop that, he would have. Whereas... um, How do you feel about that? I wouldn't be able to preach in that situation. I mean, I wouldn't be able to preach in that situation because it would be lopsided. There's always part of me which is, you're my friend, you're an older poet, I deeply admire and I love you. You know, what's there? 
So doesn't a certain mm. amount of that depend on things like an afterlife, for example, mm. sorry, or, you know, religion, or, yeah. or, you know, I mean, the fact that, you know, I'm an atheist, I, I go, I go. I'm mm. not looking down like, oi, you know, yeah. they burn those, as I said, yeah. right? And it is kind of a little bit, you know, revelatory to say, well, in case I meet him in the afterlife, I better, it, particularly with yeah. someone who's a legend. Yes, yes. Um, do we have a responsibility to society to override the orders of a genius, to burn things that give us a deeper insight into that genius? Should well, we take his brain and burn it if he didn't want his brain yeah. to be examined? I think you need to work out how explicit they were about it. I mean, the big example is Kafka, who said, I want everything destroyed, I want everything burned, I want no record. And his executor and his friend both said, no. Screw that. But he'd said no to him while he was alive. He oh, said, okay, you know, okay, yeah. Whereas the thing with Larkin is that Larkin hadn't said, destroy all yeah, my unpublished stuff. And also Larkin deliberately... In, in my day job, I'm, I'm a legal clerk, so I know a little more about, about Will's private administration. Mm. And Larkin did this will, which he kept revising until it was self-contradictory. So the will was declared repugnant and invalid. Nobody believes he did that by accident. He, yes, he left the idea of, no, I'm not a great genius, I'm not a great poet, don't read any of my stuff or anything like that. So he had a secretary who he knew would destroy the diaries, but he had two executors who he knew were going to go through the unpublished poems. And, and a lot of the unpublished poems he had shown to people, he had sent around with letters and things like that. Right. That's circulation. How bad were the ones he didn't publish versus the ones he did? There are two poems that he didn't publish, um, one called Love Again and one called Letter Found About Girls. Love Again was blindingly revelatory. It was because it, they are both very good poems. And in his letters you see him saying, in fact, about Love Again, which is the completely revelatory one, he writes to people and says, what do you think about this? Can I publish it? No, because he knew that he was formed in people's heads as a certain type of poet by then, mm. and he liked the fact that it was quite a boring one that wasn't going to cause anyone any trouble. It's a poem that again and again in the posthumous stuff, and Ian Hamilton obsessively returns to it because he just says... You know, where was this? So there's a hidden masterpiece or two. There's two, but there's a, there's two hidden masterpieces. You know, there's also three published collections of masterpieces yeah. as well. My argument about Larkin was he and others argued that he never read anyone really. He liked old fashioned poetry and he liked white, old white men and things like that. He worked very hard himself to perpetuate that as an image. But he actually loved the beat poets. Um, his two favorite poets, pretty much in the 20th century, were Sylvia Plath and Dylan Thomas. He recognized that as a person, he couldn't be the ect bard or poet in the way that they were. He was a librarian in Hull. You know, there There's were, a certain Alan Bennett kind of thing. Yeah, that was a huge Alan Bennett thing. And, and, so you're kind of saying that a lot of his life, you feel, was kind of infinite jest-esque. He was kind of poking fun at everyone where he could, yeah. including... You know, because I mean, I, I, the, the racism in the letters look, it almost looks planted as well. Isn't it? He's racist in the letters to racist fans. And um, I don't think any claim of Larkin being a vindictive or unpleasant person survives a reading of his jazz writings. And the racism is performative. The racism is performed until the end of his life, where he and Monica Jones just start drinking gin at eight o'clock in the morning. That's and vicious. yeah, and are trying to kill themselves. Mm-hmm. And then end up singing racist songs and then end up saying all this stuff. But it is performative. It doesn't stop it being offensive. It doesn't stop it being racist. No. But it's performative. How much do you think people should be protected after their death from the hagiography of their life being dismantled? <laughs> yeah, well, I, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I compare it to how people talked about Richard Nixon towards the end of his life. Where people yeah. were saying Richard Nixon became this accidental beloved grandfather of America and, and you know Hunter S. Thompson's thing with Nixon was that yeah. he, he hated Nixon but he understood Nixon he understood the insecurity he understood, you know that brilliant story about the about the one conversation that Thompson and Nixon ever had where they were driving from a gig which he was covering like a rally um, to the airport and they said you can you can ride with the candidate but you can't talk about politics and yeah. he got in and they talked about football because no one would talk to Nixon about football yeah. and so Nixon is, Nixon's only that was memory on the of, trail, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah 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 so Nixon's only memory of Andrew Stampson is of really liking him and I so, miss those I miss those him and PJ O'Rourke and these guys just dismantled mm. like wouldn't it be great to see them just fucking yeah, you know go. zorrowing up fucking you know because he it doesn't seem to be the sort of you know, there's brilliant journalists like, mm. uh, you know, Rachel Maddow and all these people who just 
record and report and ridiculous the mm-hmm. ridiculousness of what's going on, but there's no one who's just like properly skewering him in the way that balloon that went up in London yeah. skewered. There's him. a cosmic, I mean, galactical silence where I'm trying to hear what Chris Merchants would be saying about oh, Trump. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, and that's the and that's the thing that the silence of Hitchens about Trump has been. Is but, uh, Am I wrong in saying that there is a there are people who understand poetry? We mentioned Dylan Thomas, right? So Dylan Thomas, I I am very inspired by Dylan Thomas mm. because I read Dylan Thomas. I even do pastiches looking out over the, the Dublin sky and the snow as it falls and cats walk along the wall. You know, a child's Christmas in Wales and a fire goes off and I know what the fuck is happening, yeah. right? Seamus, our greatest poet in Ireland of the last 50 years easily, maybe of the last century. You know, I don't understand a lot of Seamus's poetry. I think mm. it looks nice. I think it, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I had this Really? Yeah. Oh, sorry, that, so that sounds really concerning. I've, I've never known anyone to be confused by Shane by Singing. Well, before. I find, I find, you know, for example, say David Harson when he goes into his Greek mode, or, you know, I don't know anything about Greek. You do. You studied it, yeah. right? I know about Santa Claus in Wales and the fire yeah, yeah. going off in a cottage. This idea of accessibility, and then there's, and again, to a, as a layman, there's this kind of erudition that I can't keep up with, even in this conversation. Like, I don't know an awful lot of people that you know and you're so intensely into it that's my problem you've mm. studied it and I'm asking you the questions yeah. but is it but is there a kind of, and then there's a little bitchiness that goes on as well between oh god yeah. between you yeah. know oh, that's dog roll that's shit I would never have done that yeah. explain that is that real or am I making that up I don't know but poetry world it's, um, it's what Don Patson said it's you know, Vegas without the glamour or something like that <laughs> and then it's, and he said, that really know, is saying something no I know yeah. <laughs> um, when I saw the next view and what we went after with it, we just felt that com- combativeness was missing, and we felt that the argument okay. was missing. And the and, was bit, yeah, and, better poetry. Yeah, and but, but, well, but I'm not a poet who started out in creative writing courses. I don't have anything against them as courses, um, but I, I I do think you shouldn't t- teach them at undergrad. Mm. I think they have to be postgraduate because you because you have to have read a lot mm. in order in order in order to write. I think. There's a phrase which one of my, my friends uses a, a bit from up north, which is, where I come from, you say certain things standing up. And huh. I think that is true. And it's because I was... I was Ready for a fight, you mean? I was immature and scrappy when I was younger. I used to get to fights, boxing, I used to run up in boxing, I didn't have any money. I'm not proud of any of it. It's not good. I'm no longer a violent person because it's frightening and dangerous and it's... Mm. Um, it's I can see... Yeah. I can see... It, uh, I think with you, and yeah. I can see it very. Uh, yeah, and I can see the passion. It's a passion thing. Yeah, and I've and just been surprised by the. You know, there's great poetry being written at the moment. There's, mm. there's so many fantastic books coming out. There's stuff that's just remarkable. And that's been. And long may it continue. And I have great peers. I count myself as being in a very good poetry generation. Mm. Mm. I'm also amazed by the weird packaging of that generation yeah. which means we have an enormous amount of dross and we also have unaccountable opinions and that bothers me yeah. um, I a while back when I was in the next review um, out of a somewhat juvenile urge I basically libeled somebody in an interview I libeled a critic and poet called William Wooden and he called me out for it he called me out for it and um, at the time I was very I was very scrappy about it but now I look back and actually the first time I met him a couple of years later I, I looked at him and I was like yeah and I'm sorry about that I got that completely wrong I got it completely wrong it was McKeesman and it was me trying to be something else and it was me lying because that's what libel is I knowing know at the time you were lying no 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 no, no, no I decided on something to look tough and I found facts to back up my argument and which is what Dave Gose has been doing let me just quickly years. move out of yeah. your, out of your um, I want to just quickly finish out of your childhood thing from what I've heard from you so far there, there seems to be this drive from a very early age through you. I mean, t- t- talk to me a little bit about mm. the socialism and all that element to your mm. being. Where that came well, from. I mean, one of the things is that my, my dad was a veteran. He was, he... Like, are you religious now? Um, I, I was a council Christian, but I'm, I'm also believe very strongly in the personal nature of things. So I, I go to eight o'clock book of gone prayer mass on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. I believe in God, but I also, I, and I believe that I experience God, but I'm also aware that I'm a manic depressive who at times has believed things that aren't real and also has suffered from auditory hallucination and I've thought that things went there, you know, were there when they weren't. And so I trust that it is a belief in God, but I could How be... How would you go you know, into bat with Hitch on that topic? I wouldn't. 
because <laughs> you know life's too no short. Would. Life's, no, it's not. It's, it's, not, a, reason, it's not a sense of intimidation or anything like that. Chris Hitchens was you know, maybe the last great public intellectual and arguer, mm-hmm. but his argument was the John Stuart Mill line of. Um, it's absolutely fine for you to have this belief and things like that. It's when it wanders into society and ends up killing people. Yeah, that's kill a problem. And I by the way, I'm com- I'm completely fine with that as well. Yeah. I find it very difficult, having read and indeed translated the Gospels, it took me a lot to equate the drive of Christianity with organised religion. I, what I do is I, I attend a short, brief, respectful, no sermon, no, no hymns, piece of worship. Th- but that's something I came to in my late 20s and 30s after having been wow. raised in the church and sort of assuming that because I was going to church every Sunday and my dad was a vicar I believed in God which wasn't actually the case what my parents demonstrated in their two career paths is that they are both deeply ardent um, socialists and they believe in community change and they believe in care and they believe in looking after one another and my mother worked out that the way that she could best do that was by teaching and my father worked out that he could do it by being a vicar so that's the Christianity and the socialism I believe in it's, it's, it's similar to the liberation theology that was so important in South America during the year and which as much as he probably would never admit it himself I think played a part in forming Pope Francis with his best intentions I'm an ardent anti-Catholic but so I've been, I haven't stu- I haven't read or studied the Gospels, but I, I have done most of Bart Ehrman's lectures, a historian view of the Gospels. And mm-hmm. Could this have happened, and why did Thomas do it? So I, I, I'm, I'm studying that bit. I just have a problem with the built-in excuse that is inherent in religion, which says, and I think it's going to be a real problem if we want to fix climate change, for example, mm-hmm. or if we want to fix things, because it's, it's like, oy vey, inshallah, tomorrow will be another day, it's just mm-hmm. God's will. You know, pestilence and storm, and think just yeah. be God's will, no, and we no. can, and, 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 and even some religions preach end of days, and here it comes, folks. Yeah. You know, and I have a real problem with, especially That's... our young minds are getting. We need these kids to understand philosophy, mm. to understand geography, to understand astronomy, mm. and well, it's what it's what Hypatia of Alexandria, who was an astronomer and deeply clever woman, who was murdered by the early church, who was skinned alive and then stunned to death. And she um, was one of the people who came up with the Copernican idea of the elliptical orbit, like 600, 700 years yeah. and before everybody else started thinking about it. But she said that the, her objection to, because she'd grown up in polytheistic um, Alexandria, where there were, you know, plenty of, there were plenty of religions, the yeah. weird thing about this new one under Cyril, the patriarch, was that th- there weren't allowed to be other ones. And by the way, let's get rid of that library. And she said something, I'm going to misquote her poorly, she said that um, you can't claim that these things are certain and place them in the minds of children, because they will take root there, and then they will fill their heads with all the other things that they do, but these things will be at the centre. And she says you can only remove them with knives. Mm-hmm. And because so few of us turn it on, on ourselves, we will turn the knives outwards. And that's right, completely yeah. true. And it's, and it, But it's also the, I mean, certainly the climate change denial. And yeah, the weird bunch of Christians who run around doing it. But Sartre said, it's bad faith. The lengths to which human beings will go to pretend that we don't have agency in order to anything for a quiet life, it's Billy Bragg is saying. Yeah. And that's the issue there. And then the other thing I was just going to say is that the, you know, for the middle stroke upper level, it, it is a built-in kind of salved conscience of why we don't have to fix poverty. The, to the massively poor in Africa, it's a yeah. hope giver that says oh well this must be or you know the, the lower caste in India this is my lot this God God has willed me to be here so yeah. it, you know at every level when you you know and I, I don't think I would have been able to think like this when I was in school I went to an Opus Day school for Christ's mm-hmm. sake and sorry and, and uh, without the internet and the ability to just see a bigger picture and then go okay that was weird that is clearly wrong you know that's like Santa Claus and, and yet we need it I remember a girlfriend of mine once said she read the end of faith as she she said to him, does he have to be so arrogant about it and mm-hmm. i said well if you're up against one of the most arrogant institutions yeah. in the world yeah you bring a gun yeah, to a gunfight you, gun do, you, fight, think, you yeah. know yeah. um but we kind of need it yeah we do i say inshallah from time to time but i only ever say it when there's something bad happening to me which i don't quite understand and not when i say bad happening to me like Oh, and I'm being ripped off of the bar or something like that. I mean that when I'm on my own and there is an aspect of either my mental illness or a mistake I've made or something stupid I've done or things like that. And it's because of confusion with myself. Mm-hmm. At that point, I say, all is as God wills it. But the, I, the breathtaking arrogance of saying, 
it's like those old, old people who wander around saying, why are all these people protesting? It's not going to change anything. And it's just like, well, no, it isn't going to change anything. But let's be blunt about this. You're complaining about it because you don't agree with them. You're not complaining about the action because you're trying to give yourself the appearance of somebody who believes in, in dialogue and debate. And actually, you just want people who don't agree with you to shut up. And that's the equivalent of people saying that God's got a plan for all and things like that. Yeah. I also think it demonstrates a, um, a lack of intellectual engagement and sincerity with what I experience as God, which is that it's a conversation and it's an argument. Like the, the whole point about the word Israel is it means you struggle with God and let's think about Israel within the Jewish faith rather than the state experiment. The idea that you struggle with God and you engage with God and it is, you know, it's not easy. And when people say, oh, it's, it's God's will or something like that, that's them saying they don't want to talk about it. The idea that there's a, you know, we, we have to, and again, this factors in free will and, you know, I'm not sure Sam Harris is 100% whether there is no free will. Mm. But, you know, that this idea that there is an internal dialogue that goes on in me anyway, where, yeah. you know, I, when I'm going to sleep at night, there'll be two people talking. You know, there'll be a, mm. well, what if I did this? Well, maybe you shouldn't do that. You know, it's whether it's angel yeah. and devil, devil, whether yeah. it's God, you know, and it could be, you know, mm. a dead grandmother or whatever. And you use that internal dialogue to establish what the best thing to do, whether it's from a position of kindness or anger or tamping down anger, you know, and working on yourself and making sure you're the best person you can be. Yeah. And I can very easily see how that becomes God. Yeah. Talking to you and I say prayers at night that I wake up tomorrow or whatever. Yeah. But I just I also think that we need to dismantle it not because not because it's preposterous, but because we do need almost another ism mm. that is more relevant and yeah. more understanding of the future our species is facing. Yeah. And the longer that we go on with this one, yeah. which is Stone Age sort of thinking, the less chance, like, you know, kids in France do learn philosophy in school. They yeah. don't teach it in Ireland, right? We're, we're actually taking history for some fucking reason off the curriculum. Like, yeah. why would you do that? Especially in our country. Yeah. Um, a lot, lot of people had to die in France to get there. And I'm speaking as, you know, a support of the French Revolution and as a fairly unapologetic Bonapartist. One of the reasons why France and Russia didn't slip back since you had to kill a lot of people. Mm. So you then find yourself saying, well, is that is that the only way we're going to do it? And I am a broken glass in Knightsbridge so, socialist. I believe that if there was the option tomorrow, sign me up, let's go and do the revolution. Pitchforks and all, yeah. All right, pitchforks and all. But, you know, then you wander into that conversation and people have another excuse not to listen to you. Mm. You have guys out there who I am astonished at the sort of following he has, like Jordan Peterson, who's on one level extremely biblical in his analogies, and on another he he's so protective of the capitalist new liberal way we call it patriarchy, which to me is all that's being defended here, mm. by saying, well, what do you want? Socialism? That didn't work with Paul Pot, and that didn't work in Russia and China. You're kind of going, well, yeah, all right, but like that doesn't mean. Well, not yeah, all right. I mean, you, you, you know, you're thick if you're putting those arguments forward. But that's, that's what he's doing. Yeah. He's got huge that's, that's, millions of mainly I mean, disgruntled yeah, American men following him. And that's one of the things is that the culture of the thick has, has built up in an enormous way in the last 20 years, and it's, it's really, really bothered me because I, I went to an absolutely terrible state primary school, but I then went to two really good state secondary schools everything that I got came from the state. I'm nowhere near as clever as most people who were in my school year. Really? But the, I went to comprehensives that took people from council states and sent them to Oxford and Cambridge. Wow. The teachers I experienced at those schools, they could go off and make more money elsewhere. Yeah. They do. I was spoiled to the extent that the state was there and it was well funded and it was looked after. One of my many objections to for example, Jeremy Corbyn is that he's not very clever. I care about people reading. I care about people doing the work. I care about people actually intellectually engaging in things. This line, which um, I think would started being introduced largely under Donald Rumsfeld, found itself creeping into the mouths of my friends at university where you would have an argument about something. And they would say to you at one point, when you disproved their point, they'd say, oh, well, I don't have that information. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, no, you don't. You know why? Because there isn't yeah, under, there isn't information on the evidence yet. You haven't engaged with this properly. And by the way, that means I've won. Yeah, it's why I don't use phrases like fake news and things like that. It's why I don't go on Twitter because I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a willful philistine. But I think that there is a poisoning and cheapening of the discourse which you are complicit in if you allow it oxygen. I was going to jump back to something you said about what seemed to be a strength of phrases, what seemed to be a strength of me growing up, which is. Um, there was a slight sort of violence and a slight 
thing that was there. I mean, certainly, certainly not at home or anything like that. Yeah. Um, best dog going in the world. But when I was about five or six, my mum um, got this notepad and drew up tasks for me to do during the summer, which I could do for like 5p or 10p. It was a way of a household that didn't really have much money, but I had a couple of books around the place and, and a relatively inquisitive child, which I was. Um, it was a way of keeping me busy. And I looked through the thing, and of course I went for the things that had the most money. So for 20p, I could learn pieces of poetry up by heart. And the main one I remember was Vita Lampada by Henry Newbolt. Very, very cliched sort of Victorian poem things. I can't remember the, the first stanza, I can't remember the last stanza, um, but there's a line in the middle stanza which says, um, the, was it the, the, the sand of the desert is stained red, red with the wreck of the square that broke, with the Gatling jammed and the colonel dead and the regiment blind with dust and smoke. The river of death have brimmed his banks, and England's far and honours the name. The boys of the schoolboy rallies the ranks, play up, play up, and play the game. Red with the wreck of the square that broke. Like, I didn't really know what that was. Well, it would be years before I got obsessed with the Peninsula War via the meeting with Sean Bean. Um, but um, red with the wreck of the square that broke is the alliteration in that, and it's the hard noises, and it's the sounds. And at the same time, my parents had given me. Um, tapes of Derek Jacobi reading Robert Fagel's translation of the Iliad, you know, the definitive translation of the Iliad. And I was reading Kevin Costley Holland's Norse Myths. And so I was having all of this given to me at the same time as going to church every Sunday and things like that. Uh, so I was five, six, seven at this point. Um, and, um, do you see that that's kind of weird it, I do see yeah. that that's kind of weird <laughs> but it's because we, I mean, cause we didn't really have a TV in the house and because and would, because we were <laughs> yeah, fun with Dick and Jane and you're reading the Iliad <laughs> I did fun with Dick and Jane too I know I'm joking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joking, joking. but um, that stuff I wasn't reading it I was listening to it yeah. um, but that's the way that you really should experience oral, oral poetry yeah. but my parents were given us all this stuff at once and there was one of the great things about my parents Christ- Christianity and socialism is that there was never even the slightest hint of trying to shove it down your throat yeah. or anything like that and it was always important to ask questions and it remains to this day, you know, I, I, I love arguing with my mum and dad about this. Where was the violence? Um, the violence was at school. I was, I was bullied every... Uh, uh, no, you know what, I've stopped doing this thing. In my 30s, I've stopped doing this thing where I'm like, I read books, therefore it was all right that people bullied me. Like, no, no, no. Right. So people bullied me every single year of school, with the exception of year seven, where I was at a Catholic state school in Washington. Stuff was happening in my local community, which was being directed against my dad. And I was so badly behaved that year at school that I spent most of the year sitting outside the head of year's um, office. So bullying me would have been logistically difficult for people. Like, they'd have had to do it in their spare time. And things like that. I, I had Lego, and I, you know, I had a yeah. sort of plastic swords and shields, and, you know, my, my parents took me to see um, Batman and Robin. But, but, I mean, books were always the interesting thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't like to look back and say, you know, we've all got perfect 2020 hindsight. But I don't want to look back and go, this, was the, this was the first um, rumourings of what eventually turns into mental illness and, and really fucks me up in my 20s. Because I look back and I'm like, no, I was, I was fine as a kid sitting in my room reading a book and there's nothing wrong with it. No. I would but, say this, and I have... So I never went to college. I've never been inside a university. And any opinions I hold or have, and they're, they're very shallow in poetry... But are just from what I've read, you know, like when you talked about alliteration back there, when you yeah. read that war poem, the most beautiful line ever written to me is the only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. Yeah. Because I'm there in that fucking wood, yeah. with that horse, and I can just feel the swirl. That, that's just me yeah. meeting, stopping by well, this is going... This- that's amazing. Well, this is something that um, this is something that I get goosebumps uh, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Right? this is something that uh, yeah, yeah, you have actually. It's yeah. kind of weird. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> but I want to I want to pick a few things because you've thrown yeah. a lot at me there. One is I'm 51. You're 31, right? You're 51. Or, yeah, I am. Yeah. Never had kids. That's the secret. <laughs> I was banned anyway. from watching like a 50p pocket money. Yeah. My, well, you got my, pocket money. My father, well, yeah. It's, but at a time when people were getting two quid, or, or you know, I was. My father's from the wrong side. Of I know, and you were had to listen to yeah. Greek philosophers for that. But I wasn't allowed to watch television during the week, and I read a lot as a result. Yeah. Okay. And now you know we're coming to the point where I know that you know kids aren't allowed to have a phone. Oh, terrible! Mm. Or a, or a pad. 
And you made a point earlier about I'm not making this as an excuse for any mental illness. Mm. But there is such a thing, I think, as being too clever as a kid. Oh, yeah. And it having a massively bad effect on yeah. you later in life. I, just, I, agree with the imp- I agree with the impulse beyond that thought, but I think there's something other to it, um, which is sometimes as a kid, you confuse intellectual engagement and pursuit with intelligence. It was something that to this day I, st- I still struggle with, which mm. was when I went to school, because I read books, people thought that I was clever. It meant that I was quite good in RE and I was quite good in English and I was all right in history. But I was thick as pig shit, stupid in math, science, geography, all the rest of them. And one of the worst things was because I had this neutral accent, and because my mum was known to be a teacher, I, I was assumed to be clever. And so I was put in first sets for things and then was moved down. It was, I mean, Larkin had a, had a similar experience because Larkin was um, losing his sight a lot as a child and so he thought he was getting stupider. And people thought he was getting stupider because he couldn't see. Yeah. And I, I didn't even have that excuse. Like, I just wasn't very clever yeah. to, the, to this day. And that sense of thinking that oh this will be my world and this is where I will find safety in this situation the idea of we're outside the room now and that doesn't work and we're outside the room now and we're not safe and we're outside the room now and this isn't something I can hide in I had the experience as a child of, of growing up in a house which had studies in that whether we were in a big house or a small house it was quite a sort of secret and rebellious thing for me to read the books in the, in the study so I didn't really you know I didn't really want my mum and dad to buy me sort of Enid Blyton. Enid Blyton and the rest of them. I, I read Enid Blyton. I know, rest of them. And, you know, I read Harry Potter and I remain, yeah. I remain a, a, an abashed Harry Potter fan. But yeah. um, but I remember my dad did read me The Hobbit and I wasn't really into it. And he was and probably because J.R. was talking, can't write. But, and I, I, wasn't that, I, wasn't that keen, I wasn't that keen on, you know, Narnia and things like that. So I used to creep to my mum's study and I read, there was this series that these days is called Introducing that used to be called For Beginners. They're brilliant things for kids to read. And the three I read were in, were Brecht for beginners, Freud for beginners, <laughs> and Machiavelli for beginners, because they had really interesting covers. Yeah. Um, I literally judged But you have to see, you cover. have to be able to see for like two people. Yeah. Irish and English, so uh, as I used to put it, hedge school train. <laughs> <laughs> You've gone to college, I haven't. We, our parents imposed what they thought was right on us mm. for our education. Yours was way heavier than mine, right? Yeah. Possibly because your mother's a teacher, and that's the books that were lying around. They were never standing over me with a hammer. No, I know, but you, I mean, you didn't. Yeah. You, I crept into the study. You next, wanted next to do this, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you end up going to school and being bullied mm. because it's check out the brain and you know, it's just like, yeah. you know, it's like. You but know, as I said, it wasn't the brain. That was the problem. If it because, because actually one of the things I noticed particularly towards the end of secondary school was that there was a tiny little bit about you that went why isn't this person being bullied they're actually much cleverer than me why aren't they being bullied because actually the, well, le- so the level of security and confidence with people who are actually clever and as I say we're actually going from council states and we're going to go to Oxford yeah. there's something about that that, come, but that comes off and there is a power yeah oh, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome I have that because I never went to college and people go you should go I said I want to go back to college best thing I ever did I started work at 18 mm. in an ad agency but you know no. like, ad agencies are just like they're kind of for the amount of money I've got paid in my life is obscene mm. given what I did yeah an ad for a nap that's shit by the way excuse the pun hundreds of thousands of dollars of brains working over whether we should say fruity or juicy and that might go on for a week yeah. and I go what if all of those brains were doing something, doing something <laughs> useful <laughs> because you know you can take the thickest person in the world say do an ad for a jam and oh, stick yeah. it up on that notice board no one pay attention to it anyway yeah cool and that's one of the reasons I kind of had to get out or even even this thing I'm doing now is there's no money in it for me I just yeah. going it's just my own little okay I did that right I got people who are interesting and maybe no. some kid will learn from this conversation oh. or another one and I had this imposter syndrome about my entire career but like Bill Hicks did a great piece which was you know they you, anyone who works in advertising or kill yourselves yeah you, you, you know, the, the brilliant one yeah. what did you do today well we found out that if you put arsenic in a child's baby food it makes them sleep better good night dear you know it's just, like, it's just it, the morals of an Alsatian yeah. dog are at work um, I, I've spent enough of my life amongst the working class to know that 
there's, there's this bizarre idea of self-improvement as something to be avoided and, and guilty and effective. But I cling very strongly to the adage of it's no, no sin to be born in the dirt, but it's, t- it's a terrible sin to want to stay there. Mm. You know, what, what sort of man is he that doesn't want to make the world a better place? And that is the bad of my socialism, and that's what I care about. It's possible to do great things, and it's possible to do important things, and the free Labour governments we've had since World War II have all managed to do that. But because it is easier to long for something that is fantastical and so comforting because it's not real and won't be, I think that's a betrayal of the people who are actually having to live poor. I think that's a betrayal of the people who don't have the options of education that even I, who was state educated, got. I think it's a betrayal of the people who are now having to face the prospect of paying for medical bills. Okay, so the worst people that I've met in my life, the one who's come from nothing and got rich. Ah, the fat right. Yeah, yeah. And says, Nobody help me. Pull no, yourself. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pull yourself up. I didn't go to your first time. Yeah. But no. If you don't say I didn't, I didn't no, go to your first time, it sound like I a know, blanket. I know, I, know, I, know, like, I, know, yeah. I know. But like, I got up and I worked hard and yeah. I got out of the slums of Dublin and I made myself something. This friend of mine was born in the very working class part of Dublin. And I said, I said to him, you know, if you go back there to your friends that were in school, how many of them have become multimillionaires? Yeah. And they were in your class. They were working hard. They've raised good, decent kids in a very difficult environment. Yeah. And you know, a bell curve says, you know, you're up here at 160 IQ. The average is 100, and there's people on 70. Mm. A person on 70 IQ, even if it was born into that vicar and teacher, mm. would not have ended up like you, right? Well, I think it w- w- yeah. would have ended up a different person. Well, it would have been a different person anyway. You're the product of your parents who are both smart and both mm. people who are well read and read a lot and think a lot and mm. one's reading theology and the other's reading well, education. They're both, they're both, they're both, they're both read theology, so they met. So she was an RE teacher before she was a head teacher. But they were also two people who were socially scared about people and chose careers yeah. which they knew would help people, but which would mean we were poor yeah. and we were looked down on, and we were. If we're going to do the conversation of unfairly maligned people through history, like Machiavelli is the finger I trust the most of the world I think is astonishing and because people again do simplistic things they don't actually read Machiavelli properly because they think the prince's advice was actually it's a satire and he didn't really believe in God but he believed that fortune could sort of be predicted like a river that was prone to flooding and so during the good periods that's when you build dams and that's when you make sure that we can cope with when things go bad and he came he came up with four phrases and one of them was one of them I hope will surprise you because we think it comes from somewhere else time waits for no man Goodness is not enough. Fortune varies. Malice right. receives no gift that placates it. So it's the idea that we are in control of our destinies and we can make things better, which is when we build the dikes, and when we build you know, the irrigation schemes and things yeah. like that. Because we know at one point it's going to go south. Because it happens a lot. But today's, yeah. today's economic thinking is strongly suggesting the opposite. Of it. Strongly mm-hmm. suggesting that you spend when things are shit and that you don't spend as Ireland does every time. When it's boom time, yeah. when it's boom time, you actually start imposing a little bit of austerity. To eat, eat, tamp down things like booming yeah. houses, and you, you you've seen it enough to know yeah. that it's going to go like that. When it's down, you start build, you start fixing the roads, yeah. putting men to work, women to work, building the aqueduct, building the things. So because we know the good times will come, but we're actually mm-hmm. using these funds to pay people mm-hmm. so they can eat with the money yeah. they make while still bettering. Yeah. Our, our, that, our, and that's that's how we know that the that's how we know that the Conservative and Liberal Democrat government um, was maligned and was ideologically driven mm-hmm. in austerity because they didn't put any social welfare plans in. Whereas the Labour Party went, is a, look, we've got money, we're doing well. Let's set up sure start. Let's rebuild our schools. Let's rebuild our hospitals. And that's something they did. Um, yeah. I want to, uh, if you you don't want to talk about, I, I want to talk about how you very early in this podcast talked about your book The Mains mm. and how it was a chronicle of a mental breakdown can you give yes. me your view on what happened there if you don't mind so, talking about I mean, among, among other things um, <laughs> enough water is uh, under the bridge under the years ago under the bridge <laughs> yeah uh, the book was written the oldest poem in the book is Walker which is the That's which is the very long poem at the end which is the thing I'm most proud of ever having written I was going through a period where I was married and I was living with somebody and I was, um, you know, we were happily living together and 
she had a very very busy job and I was unemployed and I just finished my PhD and we, we were living in a basement flat and I spent a lot of time sitting there reading a book but also you know drinking a bit too much yeah drinking too much being a bit drugs drugged, no. and um, no drugs at that point um, well I I took heroin when I was young I took heroin Did when you? I was younger for a brief period I laid off it and then then I had a later uh, after uh, just after the, just like after you, the look when you back and start taking heroin because you decide to take heroin that's how that's how people do it you know I, um, that's kind of a flip of dance no, there was a, there, there was a lot of, there was a lot of it about in um, in the office. I grew up around quite a bit of drugs, so I had a friend, a friend of mine who sort of threw his life away on dope. Weirdly, I'm very very anti marijuana. I'm also a member of the Leia Betts generation, so culturally I remember the picture of Leia Betts having died, having taken ecstasy for the first time when she was eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, but the I think with Heron it was different. Heron was a bit like when I when I saw that spirits when I was fifteen and sixteen when things started getting bad. I tried bulimia and I tried self harm and I knew that drinking beer wasn't going to solve this, but I knew that drinking whiskey was. And I had a similar thing with Heron, which is which as John Cray says, where he says, I knew it was my drug. I knew I want I wanted that, and I was going to be fine. I wasn't going to get addicted to it. I wasn't going to be. And so I had a small double when I was younger for a bit. And I'd laid. Have you ever wanted to I'd die? Laid, I'd laid, well, there have been three, att- three attempts of wandering near that. And um, I, when I was 15, I was cataclysmically depressed for the first time and I tried to kill myself. And I did it in my 20s and I did it in my 30s as well. And, um, and was the, that no way, do you ever think? Or I always? don't know. I have absolutely no idea about that. The the difference between the way I dealt or didn't deal with it when I was a teenager and I dealt or didn't deal with it when I was in my twenties is that when I tried to do it in my thirties, I decided afterwards. Um, well, I was after a conversation with a very close relation of mine where, where they said, "I'm a great believer in just carrying on regardless, but actually we we need to do something." And I did do things. I got stuck on smack. And it was what I did a lot. And that's what being on smack is. You delegate. You know that you're trying to kill yourself, but you're deferring. It's bad faith. It's what we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. with people saying it's all God's will. And it's a way of saying it's all the drug's will. Because the drug is God at that point. And I went, I didn't go to Rio or anything like that. I, I did because I couldn't afford it, but I went cold turkey and I was supported by friends and things like that. And the day I gave up was when I'd loaded up a spike and it was enough to overdose on. And something in my head just said, oh, for God's sake, you know, like, kill yourself mm. or stop taking drugs. But this isn't working for either of us. It was coming face to face with, you know, something I, I usually disagreed of and I objected to, which was delegating responsibility and trying to defer. I had good reason for being in that state, but it wasn't good reason for being as irresponsible as I was. I can imagine nihilism being a, a vast enemy of yours. Mm. Yeah, no, I, and, I think, and a very yeah. easy friend. I mean, I think something, yeah, I think yeah, something that you can really go. Um, to get out of the walker and the chessboard. I mean, yeah. they, uh, so I was sitting there, and I, and I was. Yeah, got to the decline. Yeah. I was spending a lot of nights just staring at this chessboard <laughs> and watching Dad's Army. And, like Dad's Army was, you know, it was something I associated with my grandparents. Mm-hmm. You know, it'd be, they'd look after us in Teesside when my mum and dad were working or something like that. And so we'd watch that a lot. World War Two was horrible. And there was a moment when it looked like everything was going to go horribly wrong. And by the way, nobody knew it was going to turn out all right. So I was watching this, and I was interested by the story of the fact that um, Jimmy Perry had written it, you know, as a failed actor who specialised in spirits. And he'd written it in order to play Walker. The decision was quite sensibly made that you can't do this and I imagine killed but I imagine part yeah part of it killed him the, the visual reason given was you are the writer you can't be in something you're writing you can't give yourself the best lines and things like that and he seemed to be alright with it I mean he carried on writing with David Croft for years and they did Heidi Eye and things like that um, but you also notice moments when Walker's character because of course he's the only person in the group who should be fighting Mm-hmm. and could be fighting if he wanted to. So is the question of, is he a coward? And anyone who grew up with the spirits 
and knew that they were actually quite a maligned bunch of people. And they were the people who made sure that the arms trade in the 50s was huge. Everyone had guns in the 50s because everybody handed them in after one You're talking about, time. when you say scurvy, you're talking about sort of. The war, the, the, the de- yeah, yeah, the, 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 the walker, the walker pinstripe suit, uh, ass, pinstripe yeah. suit, fedora. Not that rich, but. Yeah, not that rich, yeah, yeah. but you know, the gangster thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the gangster pre Get Carter. Yeah. Yes, yes. You yes. know. But generally speaking, they were all a bit washed up and they were all at the end of their careers. And that's what Des Army is about. It's about failure and it's about we want to do something that we can't do and we knew that we can't. But James Beck fascinated me. He was the second person to play Archie Rice in The Entertainer, John Osborne's play, about that bit of England. And apparently he was the best Shylock that anyone had ever seen. But you couldn't imagine that. And this idea that he was going to be the great actor and he ended up in this show. And the sense of thwarted promise... It's the shadow brother of, actually, I know that I'm not good enough. This is imposter syndrome again, and this is me not thinking that this is good enough. So I wrote that poem, you know, then edited it to death, and it's 36 stanzas long. It's hugely dense. It's very complex. I'm very proud of it. I don't think it triggered the mental breakdown, but I think it was a sign that this was in the post. And my marriage broke up. I... Spent Still a lot of friends. Friends, but yeah, we're very close friends. I, I value her hugely. She's one of the best friends. The marriage broke up. I spent a lot of time in the Highgate Mental Health Centre. I was very, very unwell. Um, I believed a lot of stuff that wasn't real. There was video footage of me sitting in therapy sessions where I'm throwing chairs across the room because I think there's somebody inside the room. I was hallucinating. I thought things were things were there that weren't real. And I wrote these poems every night about my brother. As I say at the start of one of the poems, I've never had a brother. I have a sister I'm very close to. But there was one brother who appeared and he was there to remind me and he was he was there as the doppelganger and he was there as, you know, as the herald of doom to say, this is bad. This is as bad as it can get and it's awful. And then this other brother appeared. He's this other version of The Road Not Told where the voice of the book goes and spends time with a vicar because I, I wanted to be a vicar until I was 19. And the person has married the person who I wanted to marry at that time, and they've had a daughter. And so I am visiting this other self. And the daughter becomes sort of the the central point of those poems and the experience of certain people who I've known and I've lost, both real and not real, during my life, um, become sort of transmitted and indeed possessed the daughter at one point. Um, The the cover of the book is drawn from uh, The Conjuring 2, I'm not a horror film fanatic or anything like that, but I remember going and seeing it, and I got very interested in the Enfield haunting and the the poltergeist. Um, it was it happened in the 1970s. There were two working class kids in a single parent family in this ratty old house in Enfield, and um, it was of course celebrity. It was on the cover. It was on the cover of all the tabloids that they were possessed by this old man in the house. The two girls are still alive, and. James Wan made The Conjuring 2 and it's a big schlocky horror film but there's yeah. this brilliant image which is on the cover of the book of the one of the girls having his window explode upon her and the, the outside world breaking into the inner and that was something that I was dealing with and the idea of did this really happen or were the girls making it up and also let's put in the class angle of these are working class girls in a single parent family there's no money coming in or anything like that and they've been put in this house which is rotting are they drawing attention in order to try and just have the state look after them as they should be in the absence of the father who isn't there. But I wrote all these poems in this big jumble and because I wrote them quite late at night. I think the mains is written sober. Um, the mains it, means some vision you had of a body slit open and you could see the spine and you yeah. were filling the holes of this, which yeah. is also... It was, it was to do with fear that I've had all my life. I've got this bizarre idea of the spinal cord being like very thick licorice and, and the poem called The Mains um, deals with that about the idea of having the spinal cord split open. There is a poem that didn't make it into the book, which was about my obsession with the John Franklin expedition where they all went and died in the Northwest Passage and yeah. ended up eating each other. They never found um, the book. Well, they did. Uh, they've just found the book. Well, like, in the last, in the last two years, they found right. both yeah, yeah. of them, yeah. Um, but they ended up eating each other. And more people died trying to find, find them. them. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, the, and it was this big Victorian called Celebre. And eventually... Yeah, everyone stopped looking yes, for someone yeah. to do both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A Scottish explorer went and looked and basically found a load of Inuit who showed them loads of evidence and said, we didn't, and he said, why didn't you go and help? And he said, we didn't want to give them help. They were eating each other. 
and, imagine. and he came back to London and said, because there was still a reward offered for it, and he said, I don't know if any of you are going to want to hear this, because yeah. John Franklin's wife was <laughs> the big Scots lover. And she said, that's ridiculous. Englishmen wouldn't do that. You're a Scotsman, you wouldn't understand. And Charles Dickens got in on it. And Charles Dickens said, Scots, what would they know? Did you, Charles, we should kill all the people in India, Dickens, on the day of the, of the Indian... A modern proposal. <laughs> Deep, well done. <laughs> but, but, the, but I was obs- I was obsessed with this idea of them being stuck in the ice, and also because um, having grown up in the North East, the Vikings are there all the time. It's one of the things you grew up with. It's one of the things you know. And the idea of the blood eagle, the idea of um, the sacrifice, whereby you break open the back of the ribcage and pull the lungs out, as, yeah. a, uh, as if to. And there, there is this poem, and it's a, it's a deeply disturbing old poem about. Um, for a man who doesn't like horror films at all I've got a horror film on the cover of my book yeah. and the title is drawn from this yeah, nightmare going on here of, already, yeah, a few more. Yeah. what did the poems and look like when you came out well well that was the thing because all of the poems were written during so I was released from the hospital like, during the day uh, well so in the evening and I'd go back to my parents house and I'd sit there and they'd go to bed and I'd sit with the laptop and I'd just keep going do it I wrote all of those poems and and I had no idea about what order they should go in, anything like that. And this is where John Clegg came in. Um, John is a bookseller, a very fun poet. And I said, look, I'm trying to put this together as a submission, and I, I know that walking needs to be at the end, but I don't know about the rest of them. And he was able to pick apart the brother ones and say, right. these need to go like this and these go. And he arranged it. And the moment he arranged it, it made such... And we sat in pubs, and he made me justify every word in every poem. He's the best editor and one of the better friends I've ever had. And the interesting thing is the moment he put them in the order he put them, which is how they are in the book... You didn't change much? I didn't change anything. Um, it looks like the diagram that you get in Dante's Inferno of Hell. I mean, the first poem, which is separate from the rest, it's called PTSD, and it's, this is going to hurt. And then there are the brother poems, which are the brother as Harbringer and the brother of bad news and the brother who causes trouble in the house you know the trickster figure he's the hare he's Loki he's Nancy and he's also the person over whom the speaker and the poet thinks he has control and then you have the second book where he goes and visits the other brother and he's tormented by this child and he's tormented by his brother's relationship with his brother's wife which is a way of saying that there's a line in it where it says when my when I've taken her to school my brother says that we need to talk and at that point, Walker starts off as I intended it to be, which is just a biographical study of a difficult, of a, of a complicated man. And then he actually came out of the page. He scared me and he chased me around. And I, I spent a day at New Writing West Midlands um, at a conference in Loughborough. And I felt like I was being chased through the town by him. And it was frightening. The end of Walker was horrifying. And it's, it's a scary thing. And it's... Uh, it's a poem that's very difficult for me to read out loud. I've done this a couple of times. I, I know um, this might be a difficult question. Um, um, we we mm. can if you want. Yeah. Do you think you were slightly insane writing the book? I was certain. And is there a danger that for your future poetry you have to go back there every time? No, I mean, there's. Uh, um, Sorry if that's a difficult no, no, question. No, 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 no. That, uh, just, I was on hand when I was writing the names. Certainly when Martin Walker, one of the many reasons that John Clegg did such a good thing and David Housen did such a good thing and Richard Skinner did such a good thing and Fran Locke and Abigail Perry, um, the two poets I admire the most in the world really, did such good things with helping me with it, um, was that, as Ian Hampton says of Robert Lowell, there is great poetry that is born out of madness. There is no such thing as great madness. There is nothing epic or heroic or brilliant about the struggle. The That seems harsh. No, no. What is impressive in Epic and Rogue is what you do afterwards, because you've got through it, and that's fine. But the nights when you spend screaming to die, and the horror, and the blood, and the drugs, and the drink, that's just... Yeah, none of that's good. God wasn't anywhere near at the time. Are you going to be and, okay? Oh, I think I'm going to have to be okay in certain ways, because, first of all, I can't have a... There is, there is, there is an experience of, of, of having given up her and, and gone through a smack withdrawal, particularly on my own, which I was, I was living on my own, and I had no, and I had no money at the time. And it was, and it was just awful. It was the worst thing in the world. Like the, the musicians I admire, like, well, Brett Anderson specifically, he just says, you know, you go through cold turkey because it means you won't take it again. Scary it's true. It, it's that that appalling. It's that unpleasant. The interesting thing, when you were talking about like revisiting, the reason I said 
uh, the reason I said no at the end of that was because I wrote the mains in 2016. It's it's now the middle of 2019, and I've been trying ever since to try and work out what the next book is. But it wasn't a part of me that just said you can't have a mental breakdown every time you write a book. That's um, worried you yeah. <laughs> and there are, and there are people who persist, and there, yeah. there are poets yeah. and artists and, and painters and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, Fra- yeah. Francis Bacon, in my view, the greatest painter of all time. Um, Michael Donaghy, the great Anglo-Irish poet, perpetually mocked himself about the fact that when he saw his father's corpse, he said, "If I can't get a poem out of this," <laughs> and he said, "When that is so Irish, yeah." And when <laughs> when Don Passon writes his astonishing, definitive um, in memoriam for Donaghy. Um, it's called Phantom. It's the end of rain, and it's just astonishing. And he and he has this thing about Donaghy talking to him because he says, you know, when, when he was alive, I couldn't get a word in edgeways, but now he's dead. I, I can speak to him when I want to. It's just because he's suffering this existential disadvantage doesn't mean that I should give up being friends with him. You know, but there's a bit in it where at the end he says, like Donaghy visits him in the middle of the night, says, "Donna, I can't keep this bullshit up." He says, I, I love the living, but I hated life. A sentiment to which I resound strongly. I love moments with people, but the whole existence was actually quite difficult. And he said, I knew the game was up for me the day I stood in front of my father's corpse and said, if I can't get a poem like this. One of the things that Clegg has slowly moved me towards is, it's going to be harder to write the next books, simply because you and I really give a toss about the reading and this is what we talked about a lot this evening you know. we give a lot of toss about the reading and the learning and the execution of course it wasn't easy having that breakdown and it almost killed me but it would also cheapen what, a book which for a long time I had a difficulty with I, after, after it came out I looked at it and I was like and I, I, I felt vaguely embarrassed vaguely worried but now I look at it and I think this is a fine piece of work you know it, it's a first book and it was well edited by people who cared about poetry and had read poetry. And the next books will be something else. And they will be much harder to write because I want them to be done on my terms and not on that which is done to me. And that's, yeah. I wish you every success. Thank you for being my podcast. Play us out all of your poems. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The Telegraph Line. There was horror. I carry a half weight as my portion and sleep when I can. For you, brother, tell me. Tell me of the North, as we were there again, as the younger man that we were. Tell me about the curling touch, the way that sparking fingers trace patterns over years into you, and yet their traces were marked under my own skin. Tell me how you did that, how you survived her, so well that you could talk while I wore our map as a lake of mercury on me which flowed south at the worst times, surged until I broke blood, and in the high days froze, so that all who saw me smile remarked that I wore a face of the dead, the smile of relapse. I wore the electric pattern as if it were her lace, her strap. Each day a new message hurt its way through the lines. Pain glowed new in me. Tell me how, brother. Tell me how you had the nerve to live with yourself knowing that in London I was dull to your tricks, could not swallow a meal but hate it, could not feel you press yourself to her without my finding a blank partner and spending the night trying to bring her to colour, attempting to lay my own cables inside her sensation with the hope that some certain exchange might live. You tell me of peace. No, 